My sister went to Stanford, so I'm happy to be back here. Um, I'm not going to talk a great deal about Latin America, where you're all from. I'm certainly not an expert on Latin America, but I have traveled there on behalf of the State Department, and I've spoken in Bolivia and Chile and in Brazil um, and other countries, so I'm somewhat familiar with what's going on and be happy to talk about anything to do with American foreign policy and politics after I do my initial remarks. So um, I'm not a, as Martin suggested, I'm more a practitioner than an academic, although I have a chair in diplomacy and I run a global affairs center at Occidental College in Los Angeles. And we have a standalone Department of Diplomacy. We have a program that places our students for a semester at the United Nations. Uh, we have a very active study abroad program, including sending students to Brazil. And in addition to the serious stuff, I also teach a course in sports and diplomacy. And this morning, Martin proudly brought out his soccer shirt. I don't know if you've seen his football shirt signed by Pele. Have you shared this, Martin, with the class? Have you ever seen this shirt? <clears throat> It's a national team number 10 shirt All right. with big dedication to me. All right. All right. And a couple of my students in that class wrote their papers about the World Cup and the Olympics in Brazil and how all that went for Brazil. So what I thought I would do is talk about what we thought Trump might do and then what he's actually doing, and then I think much more interestingly, what he might do in this next phase. And the first phase I sort of call Trump uh, 1.0, and the second phase that's kicking off almost today is going to be Trump 2.0, and I'll come to that. Um, during the campaign, I spoke around the world about the Clinton-Trump election. I spoke in New Zealand and China and Canada. And I tried to be as objective as I could about what Trump's message was. I've been in the Clinton administration. I supported Mrs. Clinton. But I tried to understand what his appeal was. And what I said to audiences is that Trump was not interested really in foreign policy or in the execution of American foreign policy. And I think that's still true today. What he was interested in was using certain aspects of foreign policy to win domestic support politically. And so he was very explicit in his campaign that he was going to put America first. Uh, he used that phrase in his speech at the Republican convention. And he was very critical of almost everything all of his predecessors had done in foreign policy. And what he said was the architecture of American foreign policy built on relatively free trade, military, and diplomatic alliances through international institutions, including World Bank, NATO, other agreements had all been a big failure. Uh, and that the various presidents who'd run that had failed America because they had not put America first. America had been put second to the world, to the globalization that the elites at Davos promoted. And that as an end result, the American working class was suffering the American culture was suffering because we were letting in all these illegal immigrants who were criminals and rapists. We weren't protecting our borders. And if elected, he was going to put America first and change this alignment that was really the bedrock of how America interacted with the world since the end of World War II. So clearly a dramatic change from a typical Republican 
candidate. And the language he used, I'm sure you followed the campaign, was designed to heat up his supporters, to create fear of immigrants, complete fear of the other, of foreigners, of people of color. And it was effective in many regards, of course, because he won the election. Now, we also know, and I'll come back to that, that he had help winning the election that Vladimir Putin's government decided to intervene and disrupt our election and were more successful than I think they ever thought they would be. Uh, and that's part of the story, but as I say, we'll, we'll come back to that. So we had what Trump said he was going to do. Now, he says a lot of things, as you know. Every day he says something. He tweets. Um, he doesn't really have any governor on his mouth or his thoughts. He watches television news. He doesn't read. He doesn't read books. He doesn't read briefing papers. He mainly reacts to what he sees on television and social media, and then you know he says things. Doesn't mean he's actually going to do them. And one of the things I said about his first year in office when I was giving some talks about it was that I said he had to adjust to reality because the President of the United States is a very powerful position. And in our government, the president does decide foreign policy. It's a very centralized process in the White House with a National Security Council that's now a kind of mini State Department. It's grown to over 400 people. Um, the role of the State Department has been diminished over time and has been severely diminished now in the Trump administration. But America does have all these alliances and treaties we've signed. And as you well know, we have troops stationed around the world, many going back to World War II, for example, are more than 25,000 troops in South Korea. That's a function of the end of World War II and the Korean War. We have troops stationed in Japan. We have troops stationed in Germany. That's kind of the reality on the ground, and no president can just come in and change all of that reality. So the interesting question was, was Trump going to accept what his predecessors had done, like the opening to Cuba or the nuclear deal with Iran? Was he going to accept existing treaty agreements, relationships like NATO? Or was he going to turn his rhetoric into action? And of course, who is he going to do it with? Because if you look at his career as a businessman, there's the myth that he's a successful businessman. And then there's the reality TV show. And this is really interesting, especially if you're interested in postmodernism about what is reality. <laughs> Trump played a successful businessman on television, on the reality show, and was incredibly popular. He, in fact, was not a successful businessman. Uh, most of his ventures failed. They were in debt. Um, at the end of his time before he became president, no American bank would loan to his enterprises because he didn't pay them back. He had very dubious relationships with uh, criminal organizations. And he was mainly dependent on Russian money for his business. And as some of you may know, he had to settle out of court over a Trump University, all the, the, you know. So the reality, my point is, he played a successful businessman. And that mattered more to many people than what the actual reality was. But he'd been the, he became the first president in American history who'd not held a government position. So he didn't have aides that had worked with him. Like when Franklin Roosevelt became president, he had some very talented people who had been his equivalent cabinet in the state of New York that he brought with him into government. And then he brought some very prominent academics. Trump didn't bring his own team other than his immediate family and some of his slightly more dubious characters, like his personal lawyer that you've been reading about, Mr. Cohen. And over 75 of the leading Republican foreign policy experts from past administrations signed a letter during the campaign that they would not serve 
in the Trump administration because they didn't think he was morally fit to be president. So that took out, like, usually when you have a change of administration, you have a bench of people who are waiting, who've been in the government before, or who are rising stars, or might come from Stanford and universities. Um, your own former provost, Condoleezza Rice, was brought out to Stanford to work on George W. Bush's campaign. During the campaign, she organized hundreds of experts to advise him. He becomes president. She becomes national security advisor. She brings in many of these experts. Ultimately, she becomes secretary of state. That's kind of how our system had been working until now. So Trump has to create a foreign policy team. And in our system, the three key posts, maybe four, Secretary of Defense is the civilian control of our large military presence, the National Security Advisor, who controls the National Security Council, which, as I said, is now a mini State Department, who sits very close to the President in the White House, and it's a very, become a very powerful position. The Secretary of State, which is the more traditional Foreign Minister State Department, we do have embassies in almost every country in the world. We're the only country, in fact, that has embassies with everybody except a few outliers, like North Korea, Iran, with, with whom we don't have relations. So we have a diplomatic bureaucracy that's headed by the Secretary of State. And then we have the Director of Central Intelligence who handles our intelligence operations. Um, Trump first choice for national security advisor, Michael Flynn, uh, he lasted less than a month. Um, he's now under indictment and investigation. So he had to pick a new national security advisor. He picked a general from the Army, a serving general, General McMaster, whom he had never met before. But he liked the idea of picking a general. And so he made him national security advisor. He never had met Rex Tillerson before, who'd been head of Exxon. But Condi Rice and a couple of other luminaries brought Tillerson in to meet him. And he thought Tillerson, who's gray and distinguished looking, looked like the part. So he made him Secretary of State. Uh, and then he made another general, General Mathis, who'd been head of the Marine Corps, head of the Department of Defense. And he made a very right-wing conservative congressman, Pompeo, the head of the CIA. And so that was his like 1.0 team. What did they do to fit in with his America first? Well, they did try, and they're still arguing about this, to put up blocks of immigration from selected Muslim countries. And that was part of his getting tough on terror out of Muslim countries. He has pledged and continues to take activities to build the wall with Mexico, which you're familiar with. Mexico has not agreed to pay for it. That was part of his pledge that he would build the wall and Mexico would pay for it. Um, I've been with the former president of Mexico, Vincente Fox. If you want to see funny YouTube videos, Google Vincente Fox's response to Trump. Have any of you? seen these? It's, it's, it's quite the most interesting Latin response to, to Trump. But um, Mexico's not going to pay for the wall. Um, just today, the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, said they're not just going to process people who come across the border illegally. They're going to now arrest them all and take them to court. So we're going to have like our court systems clogged with all of these immigration issues. But that, you know, he said he would do it. He's trying to do it. Um, he was very skeptical about NATO, but he didn't withdraw from NATO. He was convinced by General Mathis that that would be a really bad idea. And he so begrudgingly said, well, we're going to stay in NATO, but we're going to make NATO members pay more money for their upkeep. Um, he got into verbal arguments with many of our traditional allies who are in NATO, and he's not particularly close to the leader of Germany, Merkel, as you know. They have a very tense kind of relationship. Um, he has a very strange relationship with the head of France, Macron. 
we could talk about that if you want to. M Macron was very smart because he understood that the way you deal with Trump is to flatter him and then put on displays of you know, marching bands and military. So he invited him to the Bastille Day and there were marching bands and military. And you know, he, they were into this hugging, kissing thing. But what has Macron got for it? Just yesterday, you know, Trump tweeted that France were a bunch of wimps because if they'd let their citizens be armed, there'd be no terrorists. Uh, if they had our kind of gun laws, I'm, you know, so they, they insulted the French. That was after Macron visited last week. And of course, Macron's big interest was to try and convince Trump to stay in the Iran nuclear deal. And I'll come back to that. But it looks like today, we'll see that 11 o'clock our time, he's going to announce that we're going to leave the nuclear deal. At least that's the indication. Um, so we don't know what Macron's got for building up that relationship. The people in Europe he's said the nicest things about are the most authoritarian leaders, like Oban, the leader of Hungary, uh, famously Putin, leader of Russia. Uh, so he seems to be more interested in people who aren't ha our traditional allies in Europe than the ones who have been our traditional allies. Um, Latin America, he doesn't care, to be honest, one way or another. Uh, about Latin America. Um, he hasn't torn up our new normalized relations with Cuba, but has withdrawn a lot of our diplomats. Um, they've tightened some of the regulations on travel, but because business really likes that opening, uh, he hasn't shut down that channel. Can't stand Venezuela. Uh, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Maduro myself, but the notion that Venezuela is like our arch enemy and we might have to use military action has been hinted as kind of absurd. Venezuela is falling apart on its own and doesn't need our extra help. But otherwise, you know, Latin America is like down south there. He knows Brazil has really cute models. <laughs> and, you know, he knows who the quarterback of the Patriots is married to. But beyond that, again, not a lot of interest. Um, big issue with China is to get tough on China vis-a-vis -vis trade. He's talked a lot about it. He sent our trading negotiators over there just last week, but there doesn't seem to be any trading deal that came out of it. Uh, part of this is because the White House is pretty dysfunctional about what the president really wants as an outcome or a policy other than the rhetoric of we're going to get tough on China. And he's had this interesting relationship with Japan, a traditional ally of ours. The head of Japan, Abe, who's really a smart guy, it at least seemed like it, he visited Trump at Mar-a-Lago. He brought him a gold-plated set of golf clubs, which Trump loved. And then he told Trump that he totally understood Trump's problem with the media and fake news because the Asahi Shimbun, the big newspaper in Japan, was always criticizing Abe, so they were buddies, you know, in this fake news thing. And that really worked for a while. It was like their best buddies. Uh, but, the, you know, being Trump's best friend doesn't last too long. So now that we have this interesting set of developments in the Korean Peninsula involving North and South Korea having a summit and talking, and Kim Jong-un say now he wants to meet with Trump, and Trump suddenly, you know, thinking maybe a Nobel Peace Prize, this will be a great stage to go to the demilitarized zone. <laughs> We're not going to worry about the Jap Japanese anymore. Now, the truth is that the North Korean missiles can't reach the United States, but they can reach Japan. So Japan, obviously, and they've been our longstanding ally. And we have troops there. We have security treaty. They're very concerned about, are they included in these talks? Do they know what's going on? So suddenly, Abe is not looking, at least at home, like he's the best friend of Trump or how he's going to fit in. Now, we don't have an ambassador in South Korea. Uh, the chief expert on the Korean situation in the State Department quit about eight months ago. So it's not 
clear what support team is providing advice to the president in the run-up to what could be really interesting but very complicated negotiations. And Trump is already, by agreeing to meet with Kim Jong-un, given Kim Jong-un something every North Korea leader had wanted, which is a meeting with the President of the United States. At the end of the Clinton administration, Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, wanted to meet with Bill Clinton. There wasn't really time. It was in the waning months. Clinton sent Secretary of State Madeleine Albright to North Korea, where she was subjected to this giant card show in a stadium, you know, where people flip cards. Do they do that at Sanford football games anymore? Anyway, you know, and they create giant pictures by flipping the cards in the stadium. And it's a lot of ceremony, which the North Koreans love, but it wasn't time for Clinton to negotiate anything serious with the North Koreans. Koreans. So now they're going to get a meeting with the President of the United States. The m person that he had talked about being ambassador to South Korea was a really smart expert who'd been in Bush administration, but he had made the mistake of saying he didn't favor a preventive war, which is that we would strike against North Korea unprovoked to take out their nuclear weapons. So they removed him as a potential ambassador. They're now thinking of sending a man named Harry Harris, who was the head of our Pacific fleet, who had been named ambassador to Australia. But now they pulled him from Australia. They may eventually send him there, but he hasn't even been before the, our Senate, where you have to do to be approved as ambassador. And as I say, the experts in the State Department have left. The new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, when he was head of the CIA, it turns out had a secret meeting with Kim Jong-un. And so it appears that the expertise on North Korea is coming at the moment just from the CIA, not from our diplomats. What does all that mean? We can come back to that or what might happen. But Trump's first term team now has changed. So I would say in the run-up to about a month ago, I'd say there'd been a lot of rhetoric. There'd been adjusting to reality, not changing a lot of our relationships, but certainly trying to make good on his campaign promises about immigration and about the wall, because we know from looking at Trump voters, one of the key issues, especially in white working class men who voted for Trump, some of whom had voted for Obama before, was this feeling that immigration, racial change in the country was threatening, not so much to their economic security as to their identity of what it means to be America and what is America. That the whole notion that you know Stanford and Occidental are big on diversity was seen as threatening to people. Uh, and so Trump, to maintain his political base, has to keep up that stance, and he's done it. But on the other foreign policy issues, those weren't really issues in the campaign, because most people don't vote on the kind of issues I've been talking about. So if you were to stop about two weeks ago, you would say, so far, been a lot of talk. What's been the effect? Well, the one effect you can quantify, I've just been teaching a course on what's called soft power in public diplomacy. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of soft power that was first put forward by a professor at Harvard named Joe Nye. And the idea of soft power is that countries not only interact through economics and military power, but a country's culture, its ideas, the quality of its leadership can attract people and support. So, you know, obviously, if you did a paper on Brazilian soft power, and one of my students just did it, you could say sports, prowess in soccer, beautiful women, music, culture, food, beautiful country. Those are all things that are very attractive. Brazil has basically fought no wars, so you're not a military threat. So in a way, you're a very attractive country on the plus side. But on the negative side, there's the violence, there's the crime, there's the corruption. There were the stories about the 
corrupt dealings during the Olympics, and those kind of reduce Brazil's attractiveness and soft power. Uh, some of those are in control of a country. Others, like your physical attributes, aren't, but how you use them. So if you, America usually has a pretty high soft power quotient. Can, we're viewed as a free country. We have a free press. We've got rock and roll, McDonald's, you know, Coca-Cola, high and low culture. We're seen as an attract, you know, people. Oh, Hollywood. Yeah, I mean, uh, and usually the American president is kind of de facto viewed as the leader of democratic countries in the world. Um, you can measure this in some metrics. One is there are public opinion polls in different countries. The one thing we do know is that in the time Trump's been president, his approval or likability in almost every country in the world except Russia and Israel uh, has dropped dramatically. So right now, you know, the view of the American president is almost at an all-time low. It got very low when George W. Bush invaded Iraq, but Trump is really driving it down. That doesn't mean people have changed their mind about the American people or about baseball or about rock and roll or anything else, but certainly their view of our government. And then of our government's actions. So for example, targeting immigrants. To give you an example, there were some Indian computer scientists that were beat up in a bar. I think one was shot in Kansas City. So it's a news incident here. In India, that was front page news that Trump doesn't want foreigners to come. So applications from Indian students to study in the United States have started to go down. Why not? They'd rather go study Australia or Canada or somewhere else. I mean, these are things that over time could have a, an effect. Uh, at least temporarily, you can say our soft power has taken a hit. But on other things, nothing dramatic has, has changed yet. So now we're in what I call 2.0. And what's changed? Well, Rex Tillerson, who never developed a close relationship with the president, he was like hired for the role. He did a terrible job inside the State Department. He cut jobs. As I mentioned, lots of top diplomats have left. He tried to do a kind of business model of effectiveness in studying things. He's hid out in his office. He was basically a very terrible Secretary of State, but he also had no relationship with the president. Uh, so he, he got pushed out. And Mike Pompeo had been head of the CIA and a conservative congressman who gets along with Trump. They seem to somehow hit it off. Um, he is the new secretary of state. The new national security advisor is a man named John Bolton. Uh, John Bolton is someone I went to university with, so I do know him. He's not a really nice person. Um, he was in the George W. Bush administration as ambassador to the UN, but he wasn't approved by the Senate. We have a system where the president, when the Senate Congress is in session, you can get what's called a recess appointment because Republicans on the Senate committee, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, wouldn't approve John Bolton because they didn't like, trust him because he lies, he makes up stories, very aggressive, very good at the media, um, always thinks first about the most aggressive military option. He's talked about regime change in Iran. I mean, I'm summarizing him. He's not the devil, but he is not someone that George W. Bush could get confirmed by Republicans, so just sort of where he fits in things. You don't have to be confirmed by the Senate in our system to be head of the National Security Council. That's a presidential appointment. Can't be second-guessed or reviewed. So Bolton is the new head of the National Security Council, and reportedly Trump liked his appearances on Fox News. That's why he did it. But you now have a national security advisor, a secretary of state who are more in sync 
with Trump. And we don't yet know kind of how that's going to work out. We still have Jim Mathis, the Marine, former Marine commander who's head of the Pentagon. Mathis has been viewed as the sort of grown up in the room because he understands that actually if you get into wars, people die. Uh, he is, he's often not given the president certain options or he's just not gone over to the White House and kind of said, well, I dare you to fire me because that would be really politically difficult. Um, so he's viewed as the one who kind of stops Trump from doing something like really dumb in the morning after he's seen Fox News. Um, but now he's got a team, at least two-thirds, that's on his wavelength, more or less. And so that's why I'm calling it Trump 2.0. It's going to be a lot more interesting now and maybe much more dangerous. Again, we just don't know, and I'm not predicting any activities, except to say that if it turns out today that Trump withdraws from the Iran deal, what that's going to mean in the Middle East is that Trump's verbally sided with Israel and with Saudi Arabia. Those are our two big, they've always been traditional allies of the US, but Trump has basically gone all the way over with them. As you know, he's now going to move the American embassy to Jerusalem. And he is going to then buy into the argument that we have to lead the fight against Iran in the Middle East. And we don't know how that's all going to play out. I would argue it's not going to be really good because Iran is in the Middle East. Um, they have a big presence in Iraq and Syria, partly because of the way we invaded Iraq. They support an organization, Hezbollah, which is part of the political landscape of Lebanon. And they support Hamas, which is part of the political landscape of the Palestinian territory. So they have a lot of assets. And they have the ability, we know, to develop nuclear weapons if they then decided to go back onto that path. But we also know Israel is determined to stop them, has already taken military action against their reactors and against some of their presence in Syria. So volatile, I think, is the safest word to use for the Middle East. And it will become a lot more volatile if Trump blows up the Iran nuclear deal. And it will also further alienate us from Germany and France, who are supporters of the deal. So you know, just watch the news. We'll know by 11 o'clock whether that's going to happen. <clears throat> That'll also, if that does happen, that's going to affect the negotiations with North Korea. Because if you're the North Koreans and you really thought you could seriously negotiate over nuclear <coughs> issues with the United States, we don't know if they really mean it or not. And I can come back to how difficult that whole situation is. Um, if you're Kim Jong-un, one of the reasons you develop nuclear weapons is because you saw what happened to people who didn't have them. The US invaded Iraq and overthrew Saddam after he'd stopped his nuclear program. We supported military action against Gaddafi, <coughs> who'd voluntarily given up his nuclear program. And he ended up you know, being killed in a ditch. So Kim Jong-un you know, like, has all these people America is saying they want regime change in North Korea. You know, he wants to protect himself and his family. So from his point of view, having nuclear weapons is about self-protection. He's not going to just give them up because he had a wonderful summit meeting with Donald Trump. Why would you take his word if he then goes and blows up all these other agreements that American governments have made? Not only do they you know, blowing up the agreement, if you want, the news is always sort of delicious. I mean, my wife doesn't <clears throat> read the news anymore. She had Trump Tourette's syndrome, you know, 
he would tweet and she'd go and get crazy. <laughs> so instead she asked me every morning, you know, did anything weird happen to the president? And if I say Stormy Daniels, you know, she gets excited if you follow that story. <laughs> but I mean, just today in the paper, former Secretary of State John Kerry was accused by the Trump administration of being a traitor and violating something called the Logan Act, which was passed in 1799, which has never actually been enforced. Because Kerry had spoken with European heads of state saying we should save the Iran deal. <laughs> um, there's an Israeli, former Israeli intelligence agents who have a firm called Black Cube. Um, one of the things they did was to try and intimidate and investigate women who had said that Harvey Weinstein had raped or harassed them. Uh, now it's come out, and you can read about it in the New York Times Day. They've been, they investigated Obama's former aides who'd been part of his foreign policy team to try and discredit the Iran deal. So there's a lot of nasty things kind of going on, both under the surface and above. So here's the final piece of why I'd say it's a very volatile and dangerous situation, is you now have this much more aggressive foreign policy team that's more in sync with the president, and you still have the Mueller investigation. And the Mueller investigation is very serious. Mueller has a very experienced team of lawyers and prosecutors, people who had gone up against the mafia in New York. They're not intimidated by Trump's bizarre legal team. And they are looking into activities that range from we, you, some people I know who really know this stuff say you could call it treason. Certainly it was collusion with a foreign power, which is Russia. Uh, money laundering, especially involving money from Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, intimidation of witnesses, violation of campaign laws. A whole set of serious activities that are being documented, some of which have now been reported. How does the president respond when Mueller finally comes forward with his report, maybe with indictments, including maybe of his family members? I didn't even mention the fact that his son Jared has been part of his foreign policy team and has been sent off to the Middle East or Mexico sort of to be a quasi-Secretary of State. But he's also in investigation. So, as Mueller gets even more serious and more public, does Trump just say, yeah, that's really bad and I'm going to go home to Mar-a-Lago and just retire because it's no fun anymore? Or does he do what many leaders of foreign countries do, divert everybody's attention, usually with a war or a military strike or a domestic terrorist incident? That's where it gets to be the stuff of if you watch the TV series Homeland. You know, it's like, I don't know if you watched Homeland, but Homeland has all of this Russian subversion, fake terrorist attacks. I mean, all, you know, really gross politics. So I'm a little concerned that we're moving into the Homeland TV series <laughs> reality, that this TV Homeland's going to become a reality, it's not inevitable. Um, you know, we still have an aggressive free press. We still have a fairly lively political system. I'm not someone who believes that Trump is, you know, actually like Perón or Mussolini or Hitler. I mean, there's no comparison in, in that situation. But are we in a volatile, dangerous period now in his administration? Absolutely. So it's something that uh, will be fascinating for you. Uh, for us as Americans, I think it's worrisome, to say the least. Um, and let me stop there, Martin, on that high note of we're now entering Homeland <laughs> reality show. So do you, do you think that Latin America is sort of off the map? You know? Well, you know, usually Latin America, sad to say, is off the map. With the end of the cold, Latin America was most of interest to us, you know, in the previous century when we were worried about Europe. That's why we created the Monroe Doctrine, that we didn't have European intervention in Latin America. And then during the Cold War, 
it was all about we don't want a communist base. Obviously, they got one in Cuba, but we don't want a Nicaragua. I mean, it was all in the Cold War. When the Cold War ends, what's to be, you know, Latin America, other than drug dealing and, you know, Mexicans and Central Americans coming up and being rapists and drug dealers, you know, there's, it's not like it's a security threat anymore. Uh, and it's not, a, I mean, it's obviously of interest to American companies, but it's not a big foreign policy concern. And certainly, as I say, for Trump, other than that they tried to get a hotel in Havana, it wasn't like something they're really interested in. So, I mean, I'm not saying that Latin America is not important. I'm just saying in the scheme of things, uh, right now, it's going to be Middle East and Korean Peninsula is where all the action and danger is. There's no danger to the United States from Latin America other than Trump's trumped up danger from Mexico and Central America. So I think I have like two questions maybe. Uh, first of all, I would like to know just why the focus all about security issues, like you didn't talk about commercial issues, trade issues, or like decisions, big decisions that Trump made to simply like uh, develop the climate, climate agreement in Paris, and also the trade war with mm -hmm. China. Like to all this kind of stuff, it's quite related with Latin America maybe, and affect directly and indirectly. So what is your opinion? Well, I mean, he did, yeah, yeah. no, no. Well, I focused on security initially because they say that's the most volatile or dangerous. Now, obviously, Trump ran on an anti-globalization you know, program and against free trade and against the trade regime that had been set up by the United States and Europe and Asia uh, over the past decades, including Latin America. And you know, his view is that that kind of free trade regime made America poorer and made our workers you know, less well off because jobs fled to China or to Mexico. But don't, don't you think like the Democrat, Democratic Party agreed with this kind of vision as well? No, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think they, I don't think they, agree, they don't, I mean, you remember Bill Clinton was the one who passed NAFTA, uh, and Bill Clinton supported China joining the WTO. Um, there are certain labor unions that are part of the Democratic Party that are, were skeptical. Um, but I think that with the end of the Cold War, there was a consensus in the U.S. that globalization, opening up, all the half of the globe that have been cut off by the Cold War to trade and investment and development and free flow of people for the most part, you know, student exchanges, Fulbrights, all this was a good thing and that it would lead to more democratic governments, it, people would get richer and that was a consensus of Republicans and Democrats. Now one of the problems was that not enough attention was paid, certainly in the United States, to people who couldn't adjust or who, you know, lost their job because their company closed or had only gone through high school and didn't have the skills to move up in an economy. And many countries did a much better job of providing a safety net or training or adjustment. The U.S., because we have this skepticism about the role of government, especially from one party. We didn't really pay much attention to that. So, you know, absolutely there are people, including some Democrats, who say that globalization was a bad deal for lower income Americans. And some of those people did vote for Trump. But, you know, Trump himself was he made his money in this global world by selling the Trump brand all around the world and putting golf 
courses in other countries. And so it's not like he has an ideological attachment. It's more that he hit on a political message that was successful. Now, on the climate change, um, one of the sad things about American politics is that one of our parties has become anti-science. Uh, and that you have all these conspiracy theories about climate change, denying climate change, and supported, of course, by large industries whose interest it is to not change, especially oil companies, our rules or how we regulate energy. Um, and we did, of course, sign a climate change agreement under Obama, uh, which then the Paris Accords, Trump has left. Now, did he do that because he really cares about climate change or he really believes it? No, he just did it because it was politically popular with his base supporters who buy into these you know, strange conspiracy theories that all of the top scientists in the world are somehow part of a conspiracy. You know, and then, of course, there are elements of the Republican Party evangelicals who believe that the theory of evolution is not proven including some of his cabinet members who say it, that, you know, it's, it's not proven yet. And that's a, that's a typical kind of postmodern trick, you know. The evidence isn't in yet on evolution. We have to study, study the question. Uh, you know, and that's very sad, but that's part and parcel of it, yes. I mean, I didn't emphasize it because it, it is a longer-term danger and concern, uh, how we deal with it. And the weird weather that we've been experienced is not entirely related to climate change, but it's made worse by climate change. So there are real costs to us not addressing that. Um, so there's, I mean, there are lots of reasons to be concerned about the Trump administration, but I want to kind of emphasize the security because that's where the change in his team is going to have the most effect. If that's clear. Is, is, uh, is, there is a strange <clears throat> effect on Latin America of the um, tariff stuff that, in fact, um, the, um, for example, China will now end up buying more soy from Latin America instead of from the United States. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that, and some people have, one of the things Trump has done is conceded the global economy to China. I mean, China obviously, I mean, with Brazil, you know, China's become one of Brazil's biggest trading partners. I mean, China is very active in Africa. Uh, Xi Jinping has a strategy, uh, what's called the Belt and Road strategy, for using the old Silk Road through Central Asia and then tying it with train and boat routes into Europe. Uh, and they are providing money and development money for many countries. They've created a separate development bank to help on a much smaller scale than the World Bank, but one that we didn't join. And of course, the other thing Trump did, which he said he would do, is he pulled out of the TPP, which was important, especially to some Latin American countries like Mexico and Chile. And again, the argument was that's not really in the best interest of the United States. He did it for political reasons because trade had become this dirty word in American politics. But again, it had conceded the terrain to China. And so in terms of larger kind of geopolitical maneuvering, at the moment, you know, it looks like while Trump says he's getting tough on China, in fact, he's conceded a lot of issues and leadership to Xi Jinping, who, as you all know, is not like a big Democrat. Uh, and of course, until forced to, he was taking a very soft position on Putin. And even now, he still can't really bring himself to publicly criticize Putin, although he couldn't lift the sanctions on Russia because of all of the news and the Mueller investigation that come out. And the other piece of, I mean, I didn't, you know, there's so much to say. One of the things that Trump, by talking a lot about fake news and attacking the media, I mean, one of the elements of American soft powers are free press, very strong free press, freedom of the press in our Constitution, free speech. By attacking the media, 
except for Fox News, he's emboldened other leaders who are inclined to do this. So if you read like the paper today about Cambodia, Hung Sen, whom the president has praised, who's the authoritarian leader of Cambodia, has now just maneuvered to get one of the last leading independent newspapers in Cambodia taken over by a Malaysian autocrat. Um, one of my colleagues at Occidental, who's a Cambodian refugee, uh, has been attacked on Twitter by Hung Sen, <laughs> which we kind of like at Oxy, but it's nice. Uh, but they, they are shutting down all the social media in Cambodia. And Hung Sen, when asked, he says, this is, I agree with Donald Trump. It's all fake news. Uh, and you hear the same from Oban and Hungary and now from the leaders of Poland. So, you know, Trump is being cited by autocratic leaders around the world as how you ought to govern. Philippines. I won't even go into what's going on there, but he's another one that admires Trump. So that's another kind of effect of who we have elected. I'm, I'm curious about what you see in the region where you worked, in Finland and the Baltic states, and whether sort of Russian irredentism is seen as a threat there. Well, there, I mean, especially the Baltics, because the Baltics have been subjected to some of the aggressive measures of Putin already, like messing with their energy systems through hacking, uh, using the fact that in the Baltic states there's a sizable Russian minority from which that comes from when they were part of the Soviet Union uh, to try and interfere and cause, you know, hassles in their politics. And that's why they, of course, all the Baltic states wanted to, as quickly as possible, join the EU and then NATO so they'd be protected. I don't think it's worth it to Putin, you know, to actually physically invade the Baltics. But he certainly likes to occasionally unsettle them. Um, what that's done in Finland and Sweden and Norway is raise their own concerns about their relationship to Russia, uh, and for the first time, serious talk in Finland and Sweden about maybe joining NATO. Uh, and of course, they're all horrified by what to do about Trump, who doesn't seem to take Russia seriously, and that's in their neighborhood. But you know, so far, they you know they they when you're a small country and you're in the EU, you try and. You know, get along and do well in Europe. You don't want to pick a fight with the United States. So like the president of Finland came and mainly he tried to talk about the Arctic. <laughs> you know, change the subject, talk about the, you know, the ice is melting in the Arctic. What will that mean for trade and security? Because Finland and the U.S. sit on something called the Arctic Council. So that's, you know, the, the Finns tactic is they're not going to like attack the president of the United States. So would, but I can tell you when you talk to them, and I hear from a lot of these diplomats, they're like, has America gone crazy? You know, how did this happen? What went on? Because when I was doing these talks during the election year, and I would try and explain Trump's path to victory, people wouldn't believe it. Like when I spoke in New Zealand, polls showed 80 to 90 percent of New Zealanders would vote for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> so even trying to explain the, how Trump might win, People all thought I was being, you know, silly. It wasn't that I predicted he would win, but I had been in England about a week before the Brexit vote. And I had done, you know, one of those serious social science research things you do, you interview taxi drivers. Uh, and this is Martin's famous tactic, you know. So you talk to the taxi drivers. So I, I talked to these taxi drivers, uh, these are working class Brits, and you know, just to get their feel. And what they said to me was, well, this is a bad deal for us being in the EU because if we got out of the EU, we'd have $500 million to improve our national health care system. Now, that's absolutely not true. But Boris Johnson, who's now the foreign secretary of UK, kept saying that over and over. And it was very effective fake news, in effect. Uh, you know, saying the EU's bad, they're ripping us off. It was Trump's kind of message set in Brexit. And so I said to my British friends, Brexit's going to pass. 
It's just, you know, my gut feeling what's going on here. And I used that analogy when I was speaking around the world about the campaign saying Trump was trying the same strategy. I didn't think it was going to work, but I didn't at the time realize how deeply the Russians were, you know, involved. And of course, I, I probably underestimated, as everybody did, the view that a woman shouldn't really be president of the United States. There's still this sort of inherent bias that the president is a man. And, you know, you roll all that together in Comey's announcement in the last weeks, and Hillary loses even though she won the popular vote. But I tried to explain a path to victory for Trump, and people thought, oh, you know, America's too decent. You would never do that. I was wrong. <laughs> You can argue with me, too, or tell me I'm full of it. I mean, not, or you can tell me if you're worried. Um, thank you for your presentation, Ambassador. So uh, prior to coming to Stanford, I was working for four years in Brazil managing the Fulbright program. So my job was to welcome sort of, um, American researchers and um, English teachers. And they were there for the beginning of the Trump administration. And a lot of the conversations I had was about how incredibly hard it was for them to navigate those conversations and do the job that I guess we're trying to do in, in Australia to their students. And part of the conversation was about how I think Latin America, uh, you know, we're sort of like we're born and in, in predisposed to, to having this thick skin and trying to keep a sense of patriotism despite our political apparatus in many ways. And I, I sense that in many of my grantees that was something that they were experiencing for the first time in their lives. So I guess based on that, I have two questions. The first one is, um, and you spoke a little bit to that um, in your previous um, comment, just about how this administration is affecting this American sense of patriotism, specifically for, for Americans living abroad, and then also how you might advise um, somebody who is in that position to kind of carry out public diplomacy as an American um, and then speak about this administration to people from in other countries. Right. Well, you know, this is not the first time it's it's happened to you know Americans, um, and certainly of Americans of Martin and my age. We went through the Vietnam War, and what we had to do as students when we traveled was to say, you know, and often foreign students would say, "We still like the American people. We just disagree with your." government. And we had to say, you know, we're not anti-American, but we think the government policy in the Vietnam War is wrong. Um, and, you know, I did that when I traveled as a student. And we also, of course, had the right at home to protest our government's policies, which, you know, hundreds of thousands of people did. And I often, again, found that many people you dealt with as you traveled made that differentiation. You know, there's the American people and the American government. And so, and some of that was true when Bush was president. I actually was sent by the State Department on what are called public diplomacy tours when Bush was president. I probably got away with it because he'd been my university classmate. And I was respectful, but I would be in foreign countries explaining why what he was doing was wrong or why, you know, the invasion of Iraq was a mistake for the United States. I didn't, you know, call the president the devil like uh, Chavez, Hugo Chavez. Remember, if you know the famous appearance in the UN, Hugo Chavez talked about Bush as the devil. And then he held up a copy of one of Noam Chomsky's books and said, Bush should read this to learn about American imperialism. <laughs> I mean, you know, I didn't do silly stuff. Uh, but I was quite clear that, you know, one of the strengths of America is that even the current State Department would send me out to talk and I could disagree with the President of the United States. So, in you know, and that's usually what we suggest to our Fulbrighters and everywhere else is that, you don't call the president names. You try and explain why you don't support what this administration 
is doing. It, I would, I'm, granted, it's a lot harder with Trump because he's not just a opposition, you know, a different party. He's a different kind of person, and you have all these other elements: his behavior with women, his loose tie to the truth. It's harder, and you know, even some of my colleagues get. They let Trump drive them a little crazy, you know, and they'll say something stupid to the media and get in trouble with their university because, you know, and I don't, I don't think anybody should do that. But I do think, you know, you still would emphasize, and I tell my students this who are studying abroad, explain if you're asked what you don't like about it, uh, and, but don't, you know, get personal about it in terms of the president and don't use rude language. But, you know, so far we have the right to do that, uh, both at home and abroad. And so we exercise, you know, we should exercise it right. But as they say, you do it in a way that would be effective and just, you know, getting into, tw I mean, I'm, I'm opposed to Twitter in general because it doesn't lead to rational discussion. Uh, in fact, what's interesting, and I can recommend a really interesting book you want to read a much more complete analysis of what's happening now, there's a new book out called The Road to Unfreedom by a scholar at Yale named Timothy Schneider. Uh, he's a leading historian of Eastern Europe. He'd written a little best-selling book last year called On Tyranny, Lessons from the 20th Century, what we learned from the 20th century about how you deal with tyranny, uh, you know, the kind of tyranny that can lead to the Holocaust. And his new book is about Russia, Europe, and America. And one of the things he points out is, and this is part of the whole what we call globalization myth, was that the rise of the internet would increase democracy. Well, in fact, as the internet has spread, the number of authoritarian governments has increased and the number of democrats decreased. So not necessarily causation, as we say, but correlation. So there's no evidence that the internet or social media has actually been good for government. You know, there's one or two isolated cases where people said, oh, you know, they went on Facebook and everybody came to a demonstration. But I mean, overall, social media we now know is very fraught. One, you can fake it all. You can create bots and create fake people and fake pros. And certainly Twitter plays to non-thinking, which is, you respond immediately, you know, and how many characters. That's not a, and I've also found, like even among my academic colleagues, that people will say things in email, like about Martin Carnoy, that they wouldn't say to his face. And I don't know if you guys have that experience, but, uh, you know, at our, my own school sometimes when people have gotten heated arguments, people will send out an um, email to every member of the faculty denouncing somebody else. And I, and I swear they would never do that if that person were in the room. But it allows for this kind of both impolitic and impolite behavior because there's no consequence because it's all out there. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm really dubious at the moment. And I also think that we've forgotten about competition and monopoly with Facebook and Microsoft and Google. It's like, okay, we get cheap things, you know, in the mail or... We, Alleged Amazon, you know, allegedly you get free services from Facebook, but now you find out they're harvesting all your data and making money off it. Uh, plus, it's playing into other countries' subversion of the U.S. So, uh, you know, the world we're in has become, I think, everyone thought, we, you know, we had the end of history. Your professor here at Stanford, Frank Fukuyama, talked about you know, the end of history with the end of the Cold War and everybody was going to buy into liberal democracy and capitalism. Well, we know that's not true. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we seem to be going in the other direction. You also wrote a book called Trust. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, for your generation, there's a lot of kind of rethinking about democratic government, international affairs, global economy. Uh, hopefully, you know, that'll also go on in our country. We'll have some younger people running for president. We have a lot of younger people, especially women now, turning out to run for Congress. 
So there's been a kind of healthy counter reaction to Trump. So even while all the sort of dangerous things I've described in Washington are going on, out there in the country, I would say there's a lot of positive things, but the power balance hasn't shifted yet. about these issues of repelling uh, people and uh, what would happen in, in the American economy, say for example, if the Chinese scientists and the Indian uh, scientists would go back home because they, they don't feel well here, uh, there wouldn't be enough uh, native American or American citizens to produce uh, science enough to keep up technology and leading uh, in several fields. How, how do you see that? Well, I mean, I don't think that's true right now. And also remember, you know, a lot of these people are in fact American citizens. I mean, m most Chinese scientists are in fact Chinese Americans, some of whom have been here, you know, for a hundred years who build our railroads. Uh, in California. Um, so a lot of Indians have become citizens. Uh, but for the future, absolutely there is this concern that one of the strengths of America has been that we're an immigrant nation. Uh, I mean, Martin's family came from Poland. Uh, part of my family came from Denmark, the other came from Austria. I mean, almost all of us came from somewhere else. And a lot of our smartest, you know, scientists came as refugees after World War II. So, you know, this is a real strength for the, and having all these foreign students come to Stanford. So, obviously, the danger of America first, if, you know, let's say Trump triumphs and gets reelected. Now, over time, that would be a real danger, I think, to the strength of American economy, American science. If he got reelected, you had a party that said they don't believe in, you know, science, and we don't want foreigners coming, then the effect would be really bad. Are we there yet? No. It's more right now, it's like, you know, our reputation is bad at the moment. But, like, I still have, I have Chinese students in my class. They're not all fearful and going home. You know, they still find it more interesting to be in an American university than the atmosphere back home where now suddenly they have to study Karl Marx again. So, you know, we're, we're, America hasn't changed. Our government has changed. Over time, if you had this kind of government for eight years or more, then I think we would be worried. But part of worrying about that future is to make sure it doesn't happen. <laughs> and that's why, you know, there's all this political organization going. You know, that's why I jokingly say you all are here in the West Coast liberated zone. Uh, you know, uh, we have a governor who stands up against it. We have an attorney general who stands up against it. You know, the mayors of almost every city up and down the coast stand up against the government. So, you know, that's part of our system being federal and decentralized and a good thing. So, you know, and we even, like, we control the, the arms here. We control the police and the, you know, military on our side of the country. So I feel, like, very secure here in California. But yeah, we're the fifth largest economy we're the, in the world. California's the fifth largest economy in the world Just at the moment. Uh, so, but, of course, the strength of California has been immigration, diversity, and our wonderful mix of public and private universities. The system of state and public universities and state colleges and private institutions like Stanford, Occidental, where I am, I mean, this has all been the system that works really well in California that other parts of the country actually should adopt. Uh, and it's the model I used to talk about, like when I was in Chile for the State Department, you know, and I was saying 
California is the ideal model for Chile. Um, and Martin knows this because he gave me this example, but you may not know this, that one of the reasons why we have such a great wine industry in California is because of the University of California at Davis created a school of winemaking. And most of the top winemakers came out of the University of California at Davis. Uh, and was it the asparagus crop in Peru or Chile that came out of, huh? No, it came out of the La Molina, the uh, agricultural university in, in Lima. Right. Produced all these agricultural engineers, and they went into business and produced all the fruit exports. And it, starting in the 1985, Peru is now the biggest exporter of asparagus in the world. Right. But it was a classic example of, you know, public-private. I mean, the truth is, you know, all these people get into stupid theoretical arguments about, you know, capitalism and socialism. But in fact, every economy in the world is a mixed economy. It's just a question of what the mix is. And if you have a healthy mix, like we do in California, of public and private, it works pretty well. And you're open to, you know, new people and new ideas. And you'd think this is so simple and it's been demonstrated <laughs> over a long period of time. And but you, And if you shut off the public spigot like in Kansas or Wisconsin, yeah. Guess what happens? Yeah, or if you don't invest in education, uh, you know. Or I don't know if you realize that almost every major component in your Apple iPhone was developed by the U.S. government's research unit called DARPA in the Department of Defense. <laughs> Apple just commercialized it. So anyway, that's, you know, I kind of like, we know the model. It's just the politics of the model is the hard part. You're, you're living in a progressive enclave which functions really well. Now, of course, to be truthful, Texas, with its oil money, is able to function also as a federal Well, except enclave. that it has the worst, one of the worst education systems. No, no, it's not true. Oh, it, no, it is true. No, no, it may be. No, no, I, <laughs> I, I don't agree. Okay, we could argue about Texas. It's to, to, to medical services and all that, and Anything that has to do with uh, health is terrible, except for some crazy We don't want to have this debate about <laughs> California versus Texas. So Texas is an anomaly, but it, it is getting worse. Well, the but it, system is going down. it's an anomaly because it's, it's a bit like any oil-based economy, which is, you know, as long as the price of oil is up, you can spend money. Well, they didn't do it. It was because the University of Texas. And uh, what's his name? The guy who ran for president? Ross Perot. Ross Perot. And also because, you know, the other strength of Texas is they actually have very diverse big cities. Dallas and Houston, you know. Oh, Houston had a black gay mayor. I mean, they've got diverse cities that are really dynamic. Anyway, we can. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Joe. Thank you.